each of my portraits in a way represents a part of my life. So when you see all my portraits as a collection, you can kind of see parts of who I am and what I was going through that time period as well. It's like, I know like each subject is supposed to be a portrait about them, but it's also as a collection, it's a portrait about me. You're listening to the CG Spectrum Podcast. CG Spectrum College of Digital Art and Animation offers specialized career training for the film and game sector. Join our hosts, Career Development Manager Maxine Schnepp and CGS Mentor Justin Molman as they chat with industry experts doing cutting edge work in film and games. Now, on to the show. Hey everyone, this week I got to interview Ian Spriggs. He creates these hyper real 3D portraits. They're unbelievable. Please go check them out before you listen to this episode. He's also someone who previously worked at some studios you may recognize like ILM, Image Engine, Mr. X, and Unity Technologies. And we talk a lot about how he transitioned from traditional art to digital art and how people perceive his digital portraiture versus some more standard sort of 3D character artists. Ian also answers some listener questions. So please leave some questions and comments because they might be featured on the next episode. You have some of the most unique 3D portraits I've I've ever seen. They go beyond just uh, character design. I think, you know, here at the, the school that I teach at, you know, we focus a lot on execution and just like, here's a concept or here's, here's an object, make it, make it look exact. And most mm-hmm. people that learn character art, They don't really think about um, emotion. They don't really think about it necessarily as a portrait. So Ian, tell me what you do and tell me how you got into this. Or tell me a little bit more about like what what you do. I guess I just described it, but. (laughs) Yeah, you basically described it exactly. There we go, podcast over. (laughs) (laughs) This is my podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for coming. Yeah, I, I, uh, I try to do portraiture, 3D portraiture, which has got a lot more emotion attached to it. I mean, I try to go past the technical stuff, like you're saying, like I'm not about mimicking reality, like one to one, I'm trying to add that emotional side to the things. That's why most of my portraits are of my friends, my family, people have influenced to me. So I'm trying to represent my, I, basically I'm representing my life, like the people around me, the people I care about. But uh, yeah, so I've always been in, into portraiture. I've always loved the human body, this human anatomy. Uh, I went to art school back at Alberta College of Arts, and I remember I was always figure drawing and drawing the subjects, and the teachers always pushed me away from such, like, the photorealism to more of the expressionism, and I was always drawn to this human subject, and I never really understood that portraiture was my thing until after I left uh, a company called Mr. X, uh, after that, like all the deadlines and working so hard, it's like I want to spend some time and create a digital human as believable as possible. And I created my first self-portrait. And it was that, that was the point when I actually discovered that portraiture was my thing. Like I realized this is what I want to do the rest of my life. It seems so weird because it's like for my whole history, it's like I never realized that that's what I wanted to do. And it's such a simple realization but it's like to get to that point so that this is what i want to do is actually quite a challenging to get to that realization what do you think it was about that self-portrait in particular because now you mostly do portraits of other people but what, what was it like was there a certain emotional sort of feeling mm-hmm. like what was it about that self-portrait that made you give you that kind of like aha moment it was i was in uh, like a crossroad road in my life where I was like, do I stay? I was in Toronto deciding whether I should move to Montreal or move to Vancouver, deciding if I should like quit my, my job at Mr. X. And it was just like deciding what two pathways to go in life. And then I just decided to use that time. I had a little bit of, uh, after Mr. X, I had a bit a couple of months to decide. So I spent that time actually just creating my, that self-portrait. And for me, it was like a lot of, self-reflection at that time. So creating a, a portrait about myself during the time period in my life where I was actually thinking about my own life, it kind of did a lot of eye-opening for me. It made me realize what I want, wanted to do in life, as well as like, not just career-wise, but like uh, personal life as well. And I think by doing it, it, it put, put me on the path as being a portrait artist, but it also kind of made me realize that what my love is which is the most important thing. It's not just me doing characters. It's like 
be discovering what my true passion is. And by doing it and releasing it, I got a lot of good praise from it. A lot of people said it was really like, like, like they said it was amazing at the time because characters back then were like T-pose and like it was about technical studies. This was more just about like, hey, this is just who I am. Like I had messy hair. I was kind of slouching. I wasn't trying to glorify myself. It's just to show like a very open, mm. honest version of myself. And so what did you choose in the end? Did you go to Vancouver? Did you go to Montreal? Yeah, I went to Vancouver. What did you do yeah. after that point? My, my family was in Vancouver. So I was like, I ch- chose to be close to my family and stuff. Has that also affected your kind of career choices moving forward? Like, what did you sort of do after? So at Mr. X, you were um, an asset artist, or were you specifically characters already at that point? Or were you just doing 3D um, in general? Tell me a little bit more about, like, your um, how you started. So I went to Seneca 3D Animation School 2006. Like, I went to art school in, at ACAD. I was unable to get a job, so I... Went to Montreal for a few years, just drawing, learning to draw again. Then I moved to Toronto for a 3D animation school. And then I was living in Toronto. And that's when I got a job at, uh, my first job is Stars Animation, working on Veggie Tales. I'm not sure if you ever mm-hmm. saw that cartoon. Mm-hmm. I remember <laughs> Stars, because I, I, I'm from Toronto. So I remember uh, hearing about Stars, yeah. And then I worked on, uh, was it Nine by Shane Acker? I'm not sure if you saw that one. And then uh, Nomeo and Juliet. Yeah, those were the first uh-huh, movies I worked uh-huh. on. And so I was just like a just an asset guy, just modeling environments, props, and stuff like that. And then I got a job at Mr. X. And then right away, they're like, oh, no, you're going to model characters because they saw some of my personal work. And so they pushed me onto characters uh, within a year as character lead. And then I just did characters. I was the character lead for three years, working on stuff like Resident Evil, uh, Pompeii. But yeah, it was, pretty, it was pretty fun, but it's like Mr. X is an awesome time for me. But what I didn't like about visual effects is the time crunches. It went from like two weeks per character to one week per character to three days per character. And I just wanted to like, <laughs> I just want to get, push a character to as far as I can. So I, that's when I took my, some time off and reassessed what I wanted to do. Yeah, then I did my self portrait, moved to Vancouver, uh, got a job at ILM. And then I uh, stayed there for about a year, worked at Scanline for a few months, and then I went to Oats Studio for two years. That was a, that was a, such a good time, Oats. What did you work on there? Because you said that was like a really good time. Like, what about it? Um, I could see like your eyes light up a little bit. What about that was, was exciting yeah. for you? Especially like after ILM, you know, like so many of our students and even myself, I was like, oh, that's like the dream to work at ILM. And you hear about people working somewhere else after and they're like, Oh yeah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Cause like ILM is like, it was my dream to get there. When I got to ILM I was like, I made it, I made it to ILM. This is like dream job. Mm-hmm. But honestly, I didn't like it. Like, I don't know. Hopefully they don't listen to the, <laughs> this podcast, but I had a terrible time. There. <laughs> I was just like a shot sculptor yeah. and it's like, they didn't really want me to model characters or anything. So I just ended up, they let me go. And then, uh, yeah, but then, then I went to Oats, uh, working with Neil Blomkamp. And he was basically just like, mm-hmm. we were just creating some short films. And was, we had so much creative control over ourselves. Like, I was in control of characters entirely, like concepting them, modeling them, texturing them. The animate, animator was in, like, animation. Like, he had control of the animation, the uh hard surface models and control of all the hard surface. And like every person was a specialized in that field and they were also the leads of that field. So there was like just a few of us and we just basically created all these short films. And Neil gave us as much freedom as we wanted. We could use his studio however we wanted to. We had Fridays, were fun Fridays. So work on personal projects. Then even like we even did boxing like twice a week. You bring in a boxing trainer which <laughs> We just oh my God, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very surreal experience. It's funny how people kind of uh, like, I think that happens to a lot of people. I mean, it even happened to, to me, you know, a lot of my, I have like some bigger credits. I was like, wow, like, what's it like to work on like Spider-Man or something or, or Star Wars? You're like, oh, it was great. But you know, you're kind of like one person out of like thousands you know, yeah. and you don't have a lot of creative control. And some of my favorite movies as well or, or projects that I've worked on are these little Canadian movies and TV shows where I was like on speed dial with a director and, you know, you actually have something to 
to say and you actually have an opinion and yeah, I could really relate to that. I feel like at the same time, and, and maybe you, you agree, let me know what your thoughts are. Do you feel like had you not worked at some of those bigger studios, do you think you would have appreciated the work at the smaller ones as much? Or do you think you would still kind of have this like, oh, my dream is to work at ILM? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's like you always have that idea, like the grass is greener on the other side. And so it's like working at those big studios, working on the biggest projects. You're like, this is going to be amazing. But then when you get there, you're just like a little tiny cog in the, in the machine. And basically anything you do or anything you put in a demo reel at that point afterwards, it's basically the directors guided you exactly what to have. So it's like you have zero creative control. Mm -hmm. And it's like very, like, it's not personal. It's like, it just feels like a business at that point. And so you were at that, that company for a while, but you said even still you sort of um, moved on after that. Tell me more, keep going. Like, were you still creating portraits this entire time? Like since you created that first self-portrait, were you always like yeah. finding time to create more after that point? Oh yeah. Even when I was at ILM and doing like 80 hours a week, I was still doing self portraits on the side. Portraiture is like my outlet. Like I don't get the creative outlet from working anymore. I get my creative outlet from personal work. So even when I was at ILM, I was doing projects on the side. Uh, Oats, uh, Neil Blomkamp allowed me to do portraits like on the front Fridays, like I was saying. And I, I even did end up doing a portrait of him and a couple of um, people from Oats. And then after Oats happened, I went to Image Engine for a year. That was a pretty good gig. And then from there, I went to Unity. So currently, I've been three years at Unity. But yeah, I still do <laughs> still find time to do personal work and portraiture on the side. So uh, tell me a little bit more about how you actually select people. As you said, like it's it's pretty personal. This is basically you know art of your life like this is your life's work these are people that you've met so tell me more about mm -hmm. the kind of selection process and how you find people how you start walk me through a little bit of that yeah so uh i try and find people like i always did my my, my family first because they were the most because i just moved to vancouver and everybody all my whole family was there so it's like they were the most important people to me so i did Started off with my brother, his sister-in-law, uh, my other brother, sister-in-law, my parents. So I just did all of my parents and family and the people who influenced me the most in life. So it was like doing portraiture for them. I thought thought it was like it was worthwhile. And then once I ran out of family members, I moved to good friends and then uh, colleagues who I got had good relationships with. And like each each of my portraits, in a way, represents a part of my life. So even like the, when I worked at Oats Studios, it's like the couple of the people I worked with are, are I've done portraits of them because it's like I had such a good time there. So when you see all my portraits as a collection, you can kind of see parts of who I am and what I was going through that time period as well. It's like I know like each subject is supposed to be a portrait about them, but it's also as a collection, it's a portrait about me. Have you ever done? Uh multiple portraits of the same people i think you've done more multiple self-portraits right yeah i've actually i it sounds weird i, I ran out of subjects like i ran out of people because <laughs> it's, it's quite hard to find people who are willing to have a portrait done because it's it's like very exposing like a lot of times when i've done portraits of people and i release it online any criticism or comment to that portrait that subject the real person thinks it's it's directed towards them so if someone's like, oh, this picture looks fake, the person, the subject is like, I'm not fake, I'm real. Because they they don't see a difference between the portrait and themselves. So it's very personal. And, and a lot of people don't really want to put themselves out there for a portrait, a portrait online. And also I've right. got to find, I try to find people who have influenced me a lot too and I have a good relationship with. And so because I just kind of was new to Vancouver, I had limited selection of people. So I ended up, recycling going through some people i did my self portrait again i did my mom's portrait again my brother's both my brother's portrait again both with my sisters and laws again but it was almost like a a five-year difference and so because i was recycling mm. portraits subjects again it was actually enlightening because i could see a difference between who i was five years ago versus who i am today and i can make the comparisons like my first self-portrait i could tell i was 
like I was saying, I was like scruffy hair, slouching. I looked insecure. I looked like I wasn't sure of myself. And my later self-portrait, I'm more like facing the camera. I've got a bit light on my face. I'm more confidence direct. So I have a better path where, where I want to go. And so like seeing the emotional differences between the five years is pretty interesting. And I also saw the same emotional differences in like my brother's portraits, my parents' portraits. Just seeing the difference is just like seeing how they've evolved and it, 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 it is ref, uh, reflective in the portrait. Hey everyone, we're quickly interrupting this episode to tell you about a great resource, CG Spectrum's Career Pathways. The entertainment industry is full of exciting opportunities to let your creativity run wild. Choose your field of interest from animation to 3D modeling, digital painting, game development, visual effects, and virtual production. And on our website, explore the different career paths available to you. Once you've set your sights on your dream job, we'll help you get there with our expert career training and mentorship from an industry pro. Learn more at cgspectrum.com slash career dash pathways. We're bringing the industry to you. You mentioned that you're inspired by a lot of classical art um, from Mm -hmm. your art history background. Do you find that you're being judged in a different way than let's say a portrait painter would be because you're doing this digitally. Like, do you, do you find that there's like people kind of view it in a different way than they would, you know, traditional art? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. Uh, yeah. Cause they were like, well, the way you'll see a painting, for example, you can, you, you can walk up to it. You can see the brush strokes, the cracks in the paints. You, you can know you know it's a painting. It's like the the material is evidence in a painting. Like same with sculpture, like the chisel marks are evidence in a, like a stone sculpture. The difference with a digital medium is the fact that you have no idea what you're looking at. Like you think it's a photograph, you think it's real. Like the the digital medium is actually completely invisible, and so by doing that, it's kind of uh, remove. Like we start questioning what is real, like reality. This blows, blows the line between what's fake and reality. And so I don't think no medium ever before has been able to do that. And so when people see my work, it's like they're just almost like obsessed with knowing if it's a fake or not. And it's like they're more obsessed with trying to find like proof that I made a mistake, that it's a fake image. And it becomes like that's the central subject for them to be thinking about. Sometimes overrides the idea of the what I was trying to achieve by the emotional representation of who that person is and a true identity and revealing this subject, they don't really focus about that. They just say, "Is this a is this a photo or not?" Like it's it's almost outpowered the emotional aspect. But I can't blame them for that. I find it it's a kind of a challenge which I need to figure out. I need to make them not care about the question and care more about who I'm presenting and what my art is about. And so I got to figure out that pathway to make them see the artwork behind it, not the technical. Do you find yourself sometimes limited to even the, the way that you can present your artwork? Um, you know, most people look at it on their laptop or like on a screen. Um, you know, do you wish that there was like a different way that your art could be consumed so that it would be taken a little bit um, I don't know if more seriously is the word, but like it would be recognized more as, um, you know, fine art versus, you know, digital art. Do you think that there's still like too much of a gap in between those two worlds between like, you know, the, the fine art world and the digital art world that we sort of live in? Yeah, I'll say, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of a gap. I'm still stri- striving to break that gap a bit. I mean, I, I had had a couple art shows and I've got some more art shows uh, coming up where it's like we'll be projecting on the wall or like just TV screens. Uh, but yeah, I'm trying to adapt myself to seeing like digital medium is the new way of seeing. So it's like I have to adapt the way we see them as well. So even just like creating those like side to side turntables or uh, cre- rendering like the clay shader, it's just like there's ways of presenting a new way of presenting them to be like, hey, look, this is something digital you're looking at. I'm not trying to hide it, so I'll show the gray model or either the side to side turntables. But yeah, so it's like, I'm still trying to figure out other ways of showing things. 
My friend sent me one of those uh, looking glass holograms. Have you ever heard of those ones? I feel like I've seen that, but I'd have to like look at one to jog my memory. But go on. Yeah, it's like it's like a picture frame, but it's uh, basically a hologram. So when you walk around it, the hologram moves to wherever oh, you're yeah, located. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's like yeah. a real hologram. So I'm gonna, I just literally just got it in the post yesterday. So I'm gonna start. I'm gonna put one of my portraits in there to see how that looks. Tell me more about some of your art shows and like how how you've presented your work there and how does that differ between your online presence? Uh, yeah, I had a show at Nonum in Los Angeles like two or three years ago. That was amazing. They printed out my work, maybe like two two foot by three foot. No, I know even like four foot, some of them, like they were just huge, huge pieces. And they printed out basically like all of my portraits. So at the time I had like, I've done about 40 portraits now. So at the time I had about 30. And so there was a room just full, like wall to wall, just covered in all my artwork. And it's like, you just walk in there and I'm like, wow, I didn't even know I made that much art before. And it's just like, it felt like it was a presence. Usually when you see my work, it's like you're on your cell phone and you're just like, oh, like scroll next. Like you literally have like cool, yeah. two second, yeah, two second attention span and then you're like, all right, next. <laughs> but like in a gallery, you actually stand and just look at it, which is, you can kind of have more time to contemplate each piece. Do you also find that like the crowd um, in a gallery setting when you've done some of these art shows, do you find that there's a different type of appreciation for your artwork that is less critical about like is this real or fake and you know less less worried about the technical aspects of things versus like when you post on art station for example yeah i mean like on art station it's like people kind of know who i am a little a bit so that i think they're just like oh, okay it's ian's posting another portrait uh having a gallery show it's kind of like you go into a gallery show you kind of you, you know what you're getting yourself into like, you know, they're not going to be photographs. It's kind of like more on Instagram and like the people who don't don't follow me or don't know who I am. That's when they see it. It's funny because it's like if you go on Inst if I go on my Instagram, I look at my most successful posts. It's the posts which has got like the split screen where it's like half of it is the 3D model, like the breakdown and the other half is the render. Anytime I've ever done a post just of the render by itself, it gets perhaps the least amount of likes. Because I think people just scroll past that's, it thinking of a photo. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. And they're more interested in um, the the kind of process, like the the reveal almost, like the aha moment of, mm -hmm. oh, it's a model, you know. That's cool, you know. It's, um, yeah. <laughs> tell me a little bit more about um, the process of, like, how you actually create one of these, like, step by step. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously not every single step, but <laughs> <laughs> generally speaking, <laughs> that would take a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, so once I fix my subject, I'll, uh, I got a pretty cool camera. So basically, I'm, I, the best way I can explain it simply is like I am a scanner. Like I, my process is the same as a scanner because with the scanning, you get uh, like 100 cameras all taking photos simultaneously. I will manually take photos one by one of the subject, like 360 degrees above the head, below the head. I have like a light stick where I'll rotate the light around so I can just capture the skin details, how it reacts to the specularity. So I got this whole process of taking like hundreds of photos just from the like a static T pose. And then I'll do a couple examples where I'm just like, just concepting, like, try this pose, try that pose, or I was inspired by this painting, maybe you can try to do a similar style pose for this. So once I've got like maybe a thousand photographs, I basically will have a good idea of what I want to do, where I want to go. It's not a direct copy one-on-one -on -one of a photograph because I'll usually use like multiple photographs for the final. So I'll be like, I like the pose of this one, but I like the lighting style of this one, but I like the facial expression from this one and I kind of, kind of like mismatch and kind of collage them all together and create something which is I think is more of a portrait style in the end you almost get the best of both worlds like portrait photographers almost get stuck in that that one split second you know mm -hmm. of trying to capture that that moment and I think you're still capturing moments but it it's it's kind of interesting and 
um, maybe fun to kind of be able to take the best parts of of people or, or the best parts of this emotion and um, really find uh, a specific thing. I guess I didn't realize that you did it like that, like taking even multiple different types of like facial expressions in, in some mm-hmm. cases and trying to like find, find the one out of like, I'm assuming hundreds, you know, of, of images once you're done. Yeah. Do people feel, do they feel like they've been captured authentically because it's less about this like one specific moment in time. Do people really feel like, Oh, that does feel like my emotion or, or something like how, how's the reaction been from your subjects? Yeah. I think most of my subjects feel like I've kind of captured them. Some people, some of my subjects don't actually like how I captured them and like that. I think that doesn't look like them, but overall, I think 80, 80, 90% of the people actually think it's pretty good. Like they actually think I've captured them. But uh, it kind of brings me to a point, though, is like, even though it's like I'm using all these photo references and like the subject thinks I'm trying to copy the photo references I'm taking of them, it's my goal is never like photorealism. Like a lot of people think I'm just trying to like mimic a photograph. But if I was to mimic a photograph, it's like it would lack so many details. So like what I'm trying to go for is uh, something called hyperrealism. So the best way I can explain this would be uh, if I took a photo of a sunset and showed you, You'd be like, okay, that's like an okay photo of a sunset. But I'll be like, no, that's the most crazy, coolest sunset I've ever experienced. It's amazing. But the photo doesn't do it justice, right? Because you can never seem to capture a, a photo of, like a, of a sunset. So what I would do is like I will exaggerate the colors. I'll amplify the saturations. I'll change the composition. So when I show you the, this new photo, which I've changed and modified, you're like, oh, that's a cool photo. And then your your emotional response would be like, wow, that's a lot better. Uh, even though it's based on a photograph, I've changed it and amplified it, even lied to make you feel an emotion which I felt when I took the photograph. So even though it's not based on a photograph anymore, it's based on an emotional experience you had. So that's kind of what, what I'm trying to capture with the subjects. I'm trying to capture the essence of who they are, exaggerate certain features of them or bring out certain traits, use a certain type of lighting or certain colors to amplify that emotion I want from them. And then I'll put that into the portrait. And that, that's where it starts breaking away from copying a photograph. It goes into more of the hyperrealism where I'm just like exaggerating things and almost like breaking away from reality. Do you find that you sort of get to know people a little bit different like you get to know people better through doing this portrait and do you find that even your relationships with some some of these people are changed Mm -hmm. um during and after some of your work uh yeah absolutely i think uh a good example would be um chris nichols i did a portrait of him like we were really good friends like he took me to trojan horses unicorn i gave my first speech the like public speech so he did a lot for me and so I wanted, like, he influenced my life. And so I wanted to do a portrait because I wanted to, like, be like, hey, you're important to, to who I am. So I want to show you, like, you're important to me by doing your portrait. And he also is a podcast host. So I did his, his portrait where it's like he's, he's not, his, the way he's posed is not like he's waiting to speak or he's not, uh, he's not, like, distracted. He's just looking directly at the camera, like, the, at the viewer, the viewer. And he's just like waiting for you to speak and he's waiting for you to listen. He's just one of those like caring people. He was like, he cares more about somebody else than he cares about himself. And so it's like by doing his portrait, I kind of realized that more that, that who is who he is more in, in like everyday type of life. And so by putting that in the portrait, and it made me realize that's who he is even more. So I kind of thought that portrait kind of works pretty well. Actually, I think I've seen that one. Um, mm-hmm. But after talking to you now, it's definitely going to change the way that I view them. <laughs> I think I'm going to look at them a little bit closer um, than I have in the past. What are you working on now? Tell me about um, what portrait you're working on now, because I'm assuming you're still working. It sounds like you're always working on a new one. Yeah, I actually got a pretty uh, pretty major one coming up next one. Uh, Kim Jong-ji. So apparently it was kind of sad he died. Oh, yeah. He died uh, last week. Terrible. But... 
-hmm. a week before he, he passed away, I was, I got with him. And then I was like, hey, I, like, I want to do your portraits. This is going to be amazing. And then his translator, like, he looked at me like, like, <laughs> what are you saying? And then his translator translated, and then his eyes was like, oh, yeah, like, yes, I'd love to do that. Like, and so we got together, and just spent, like, I spent an hour with him just taking photo references of all the materials I needed, like skin details and like, d different poses, and I tried a whole bunch of things. And it was also, we just had a blast. It was like, it was just fun for an hour. It's like, it felt like we were more joking around than anything. And then, uh, yeah, so I'm going to be doing that one next, which is kind of, I don't know, it seems weird because I feel like I've got the last photos of him alive. And so I feel like it's a big responsibility or I don't know. It's kind, of, it's kind of hard to say. It's like he wanted the portrait. Like he was excited about it. And so I want to do it for him, but I know he'll never see it. So it's kind of. I'm, yeah, it's just, I, I, I'm in a weird, really weird emotional space. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it, it sounds like it's already always quite an emotional process, but in this case, you know, not even being able to, sh like, be able to share it with them or, you know, get even their opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of which, do you ever kind of... Um, consult with your subjects as you're doing something or is it more just like I got the photos and then you, you, they see it when it's done <laughs> yeah they see it when it's done I used to show people and I used to they, they'll give me revisions I, I want this change I want it <laughs> revisions. Change. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like basically everybody wants a flattering portrait everybody wants to look better and they want their portrait to be their own vision of how they see themselves but it's like, I got to base it on how I see you. It's got to base it on more on facts and like who you really are rather than me glorifying something which is not true. I still want them to feel good about the portrait. I'm not going to put something which they would hate in it, but I don't want to go to the point where I've flattered them so much it's no, no longer who they are. So I usually mm -hmm. just, yeah, I just post, post it now and then that's how they see it. I feel like in this... Um... In this day and age, like people are already altering their appearance so much on their own. You know what I mean? With social media and then there's filters and stuff like that. And it, it's almost refreshing to, um, you know, even photography retouching and they, like that's been norm for, you know, so long. So it's kind of refreshing to just kind of allow someone to dig deeper and like specifically look for like every single pore and make sure that the skin detail is, you know, as realistic as, as possible. Um, but it almost makes me think again about how your work is perceived. Like when you said that in the past, like before you kind of got into your flow, you would get revisions and, <laughs> you know, people asking, can you make this bigger? Can you make this smaller? Can you smooth this out? I don't like this. Again, do you find that that is, you know, you're getting that kind of reaction because this falls into that digital art realm and people just think, oh, it's like, it must be easy to fix because it's digital. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, again, comparing yourself to, you know, paintings and portrait paintings, I just haven't heard of as many people like getting revisions in their work in that sort of way, you know, like it's more like here's the art and people just have to perceive it as art and it's like it's done and that's that's sort of it oh it's uh like a lot of artists actually got revisions back in the day like rembrandt's goya they go all those guys got like revisions mm -hmm. and it's like they were supposed to like really flatter the subjects and make them look better and so it's like if you come if you got commissioned like the person commissioning the painting would want it to be the absolute best ever because it's their legacy it's the the status they have so for example like if you have two hands in a painting it's that means that person's got a higher status because it costs a lot of money to have two hands in a painting. And so if you've got two hands, this means you're like pretty well off. And so these people would commission stuff like that in different regards and try and make it look better and better. And they'll push the artists to make those changes. People like uh, Goya, he would, he would do those changes, but he would do it in a way where it actually is 
contradicting what they're asking. He'll make them dressed up in the best attire, like super cool, like nice clothes, but he'll make them look kind of look like idiots. Like they've just walked on stage. Like they don't know which way to be looking. Like the ones person's looking behind them. What Like there's like, there's no like organization to what they're doing. So the painting is absolutely beautiful, but it's like, they kind of look like they're like, oh, wait a minute, something's not quite right. And so the the clients were like, well, we he did exactly what we asked, but he kind of portrayed us as <laughs> how we were. I mean, yeah. Would you ever take a commission, I guess, is my next question then. Yeah, I've taken uh, two commissions before. Uh, one of them I dropped because they were just very particular about what they want, wanted. They basically were controlling my every movement, like, we don't want this, we don't want that, we don't want this, we just want this, this. And then I was like, but if I'm just doing that, it's basically you just hiring me to make a digital human. My art is not even important. So I was like, well, it's not really worth it because you weren't really paying that much. So I'll just not do it. And then uh, so that was one. <laughs> I said no to that one. Yeah, I did a just a portrait of uh, Leonardo da Vinci for the clients. Yeah, I think I'm not sure if they ever used it for anything. But yeah, as for like just regular portraits, no, I've not been commissioned for any. How did that one change your process? Because if it's uh, for someone who you couldn't control the photography, because you said it was Leonardo da Vinci. So you're going off of like old paintings? This one was actually really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I did a pretty good job of this one. So what I did was I went through every single artwork he did and I eliminated the ones which are not him because we don't really know what Leonardo da Vinci looks like there's some guesses so I went through all of his paintings eliminated all the ones which 100% weren't him and then I went through the remaining ones and I was like which ones could potentially be him and I checked the dates to see if the age matches up with each one and I I came down to about I think 10 images which he did which looked as that, which could possibly quite be him or were based loosely on his proportion references. And so I basically modeled each of those paintings, like a 3D model of each painting. I grabbed like the nodal points, like from the, like the main points from the eyes, uh, the ears, the jawline. And so once I've got all those points of each of those paintings, I would make a blend shape of all 10 models into one blend shape. And that one blend shape will give me the proportions of the length of head, the width of the head, the jawline, the eye placement. And so I'd base my model on those nodal points, which would be like the average mean of all the shapes together. And then I created my portrait th- through th- that, those points. Oh, so, so it's almost like, yeah, this, this process of creating, almost like you, you created your own photography first to base the the main model off of when you couldn't actually take photos. It's like creating your own references based off of um, the paintings. That's really interesting. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about, you know, cause you said, you know, this is something that you're doing all of the time. You know, you still have a full-time job, um, but you are continuously creating these portraits. Some people are very happy to just like work <laughs> and go home. <laughs> and, and that's kind of it. Like, tell me more about the, the difference between your emotional or sorry, your, your personal work and, you know, the work that you're paid for. And when you have had to do some of these commissions, do you find that that makes you feel differently than the ones that you're choosing the subjects yourself? For work, it's like, I would get a lot of uh, job so tasks where they're like model this character model that character and I, I have no idea who they are so but I can I can create a likeness pretty good like I'm pretty good at matching one to one if I need to need it to so basically I feel like that's work is matching likenesses and so I find work is good for keeping me sharp but it's my personal work where it's I find it that's the most fun because it's not just creating a likeness my portraits are really it's like I really have to try and understand who that subject is. I have to understand who I am. Uh, it's basically trying. It gets to those questions where it's like, what makes what is a portrait? Like, what makes us human beings? What am I surrounding my like? Who am I surrounding myself with in life? And it gets to like the more philosophical questions, which I enjoy. It's kind of like a rabbit hole. I keep on just going 
down more and more. Uh, one of my latest portraits, I did, I called it Prometheus, where there's, I did a portrait of a, a woman and there's like a flame, but the flame is a transparency. And as the flame comes up over her face, you can see all the muscles underneath. It basically starts questioning like, what makes us human? Because, let me start again. It's called Prometheus because Prometheus stole fire from the garden. <laughs> and so the digital medium is like a new tool we're using to see portraiture. And so I represented the fire with the digital medium because it's like, it's a way, only digital medium could use fire as a transparency. So it's influenced, influenced digital medium into the subject. By showing all the anatomy underneath, it sees that we're, as human beings, we're a lot deeper than just the skin. So it starts questioning, like, well, what does make us human? Are we, is it our, our, our likeness? Is it, or is it our internal anatomy? Is it our internal, like, person in the brain telling us, like, driving this machine? It starts getting into those questions. And so it's like, those are the things I'm really driven by and I'm really excited about. And so when I come home from work, I can start discovering more things like that, which I find is absolutely fascinating. Do you find that your your artwork is is evolving in a sort of way then where it's going sort of past the portrait, it, it sounds like? Like, where do you see your work going, um, moving forward? The question of what makes us human is a huge subject I really want to dive more into. How... I'm going to do about that. I'm not sure. Like right now, I've been exploring a lot of the anatomy and how anatomy defines who we are. I really want to explore uh, hyperrealism a lot more because people still say like, oh, it's a photograph. So I want to really push that hyperrealism. What that means, I'm not sure. But I think the digital medium will open up a door for me to figure that out. And where do you find your sort of inspiration from when you're working on these things, aside from your subjects themselves? Uh, probably art history. Almost all of my subjects have like a, some sort of reference to art history. Whether there's like lighting from pose or composition. Like sometimes it's like you can look at some of my portraits and be like, oh, that's this painting. And it's basically I'll copy the pose and lighting exactly, but just replace the subjects. Sometimes it's very subtle. I'll loosely base it on the pose and the composition might be the same, but if I, if I didn't tell you, you might not be able to relate the two. So I, I use art history as a foundation for most of my work. The stuff the masses have done is like they've discovered portraiture in such a deep, meaningful way, rather than me like redesigning the wheel, just build on top of what they've built and just keep on pushing what they've done. When you mentioned lighting, that kind of made me think of uh, an interesting thing because I feel like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, when you're thinking about portrait photography or even like more classical art paintings, like the lighting is there to begin with. Like you light the scene and then you paint, you know, you paint that mm -hmm. person or you take their photo. Whereas in your case, I mean, you do have light, like you said, you're like, you'll take different photos with different lighting, but because you're creating this digitally, um, you're creating the model first and then you're lighting it after. Yeah, I actually light first. <laughs> I actually light before I model. And so you're modeling your whole thing like in a certain lighting? Like, yeah. Like you'll set up the lights digitally in the scene and then you'll model it like that? Oh, tell, okay, tell me more about that. Yeah, yeah, I will set up the lighting and camera first. So I know what the camera is, I know what the lighting is, and then I'll, then I'll start blocking in the character, just basic shapes, and then basic, super basic texturing, and then it goes straight to look dev. So I'm like doing a look dev maybe the third day into to doing a portrait. And so by understanding what the pose and lighting is in the camera, which is the three, the three most important things are pose, lighting, and the camera. And so once you've got those down, everything else just kind of falls into place. I know it's a little bit back to front because it's like you have a model to light, but it's, I try to do that as quickly as possible. Imagine just like, yeah, it's working backwards. It's like you've got the result, you're just fixing it until it looks like it's supposed to look rather than building it. Do you do you still sometimes alter it because you can? Yeah. Like after the fact? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of my cheats is like, I, I usually don't model the back of the head or back of like the clothes or like below 
here, like below the chest line. So if you actually rotated the model to the back, you'd be like, oh, it's kind of breaking. So I'll, I'll model to like the 45 degrees. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, is it a shortcut when this is exactly how you want it to be? You know what I mean? Like no one's painting the back of someone's head either. Yeah. If that's not part of the, the subject of the painting. So maybe part of that is some of your VFX experience, you know, of always working with a crunch and having mm -hmm. being forced to take shortcuts. Like, are we going to see the back of this building in the scene or not? If we're not, yeah. we're not going to model it, you know? <laughs> so do you find that like, um, you know, some of your background has helped you uh, speed up the process? Like what are some tricks that you have that, that you did get from the industry? Knowing how to rig has saved me a lot of time. Knowing how to use the correct character workflow, like using good topology, uh, good UVs. And then for each each portrait I do, I actually use the same character. I have, I've rigged like this base mesh character, which is super simple, but I can pose it really simply. And then I can just, because all the textures are all the same, I can actually reuse textures from a previous model onto the new portrait. I don't have to keep on redoing hands over and over again. I can do one really good one, reuse the textures, I will have to re-sculpt it and touch it up, but it gets me to that look dev stage faster because I was saying on my day three, I'm already look deving. It's because I can reuse stuff from previous portraits because I know the correct workflows. Yeah, I was a little bit shocked when you said like day three look dev. I was like, oh. <laughs> but I guess that 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 comes also from you know years of experience of working with with deadlines, you know, and having to do things quickly. You you learn how to speed up your, your process in general, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I love this, this idea of imagining you doing the, the process almost a little bit backwards. Um, I didn't expect that that's how you, that that's how you did it. So that's pretty cool. You know, you've worked at some of the biggest studios in the world. Um, you've worked on some big projects, but you're also someone clearly who values, um, personal work uh, quite a bit. Looking back now, if you could change anything or if you could like get to a certain point faster, what advice would you give yourself starting out or to, to people who are starting out now um, with digital art? It sounds like something everybody is saying, but it's like follow your heart. And so the reason why I say this is because let's say, for example, you love modeling dragons and you want to model dragons. And you're like, I'm going to go work at, at a company, but they don't like dragons. They're gonna. They want to see cars on the demo reel, so I'm gonna model a car, get the job, and so when I get to the job, hopefully I can model a dragon. They're gonna be like, no, no, we hired you because you have a car in your demo reel, so we're gonna get you to model cars. And then the next job you get along, they're like, oh, you're really good at modeling cars, and you just all of a sudden you're stuck on this route, which you don't want to be on because you wanted to model dragons. So just model a dragon. Just do what you love doing, and also. The jobs and careers you want to have, those will come, well, it might be a little harder to get there, but it's like if you follow your passion, it's you're most likely going to figure out a way to make it a living from it. It's, it's going to be stressful. Like, don't get me wrong, like following your heart and just really doing what you want to do is, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of guts because sometimes you really start questioning yourself and doubting yourself if it's the right choice. But really, it's like, it, it wouldn't, Imagine you did get the job you wanted just because you were doing what you wanted to do. It's like, it would be amazing and more satisfying than anything else you could get. Is it worth failing at something you love or being good at something you don't even love at all? Do you find that uh, it's helped you a lot more to have that art history background as well and like to be classically trained as a painter and a, someone who's able to draw first before you got onto digital art? I think, yeah, there's a misconception that if you learn 3D that you'll become an artist. I mean, the digital mediums are just a tool. It's like picking up a paintbrush. Just because you know how to use a paintbrush doesn't mean that you're a painter. But you don't you don't need to go to school to learn how to draw, or you don't need to go to school to learn how to sculpt or something. If you have that passion and love for it, it the digital medium is just a tool for you to convert that skill into a different like medium. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you need to go to school for it, but I think it's, it helps having a, an artistic eye or some sort of creative passion 
driving you to want to learn 3D? And I guess a lot of practice. I mean, you know, having a full-time job plus doing this on the side gets you to a certain level faster than doing just one of those two things. How many hours would you say per week on average are you working? Uh. (laughs) And maybe now it's different. Like, so maybe a comparison of now versus five or 10 years ago when you're at like a bigger studio. I do 40 hours a week at Unity. Sometimes I'll take an extra, a little bit of freelance on top of that. So an extra 10 to 15 hours per week. But then I'll probably spend another additional 25 hours, 20 hours a week, just on personal stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not... That that's the thing is I'm not really surprised um, because I think to get to a certain level you do have to put in the the time. It's um, but but at mm-hmm. least like those extra twenty to twenty five hours on your own projects does that feel different? Like it doesn't feel like as much of a, a kind of like slog, I guess. Like you know how 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 does that time pass? Like does it fly by? Yeah, like yeah, I, like I don't, like yeah, I don't count the hours. Like I think you know, this is the first time I've counted those hours in years. Like I just, for me, it's just I enjoy doing. Yeah, it. And like you're like, oh the, shit, it's a lot. <laughs> it's like play. It feels like playing a video game. Like I'm just like I just sit down and enjoy playing a video game. Sometimes you'll sit in front of the computer and you're like, you're like, open up mine. And be like I just don't feel like it today. So I'll say, just spend two minutes on it, five minutes. If you don't want to, shut it down, go and do something else. But usually that five minutes turns into like an hour, two hours. It's very rare for you to actually get into something and quit it. So usually if, if the minimum you do is open up Maya or whatever program you use, if that's the minimum you do every day, that should be that's good enough because it will ramp up into more hours than you think. I mean, it doesn't sound like you have too much time outside of this but what do you do for fun outside of like when you're not in Maya you're not at your computer <laughs> you're not at work <laughs> and you're not sleeping I, I, I assume you sleep sometimes what are some of your hobbies and are they related at all to to your artwork as well in some way uh just like hang out with family I guess uh <laughs> That's about it, I think. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I'm, getting, I'm getting older, so it's like spending time with my nieces and nephews. It's like I just have so much joy like playing with them and seeing my parents and like hanging out with them, seeing my brothers and my girlfriend. It's like spending quality time with the people I really care about is more valuable to me than just going to like a bar and having some beers with people I don't really know well. I'll, I'll hang out with like friends who who means something to me, but it's like, yeah, I just, I don't know, hang out with people I, I love. Let's get on to some listener questions. So one of, um, one of the students uh, at CG Spectrum, Maxime, he was asking, do you have any recommendations to sculpt in a way that is believable and natural? Sculpting what exactly though? Faces? I guess. Uh, I, I'm. I'm gonna say say people, people, because I know that he like recently one of his projects um, was a really, really cool character. So I think he's he's very interested in characters. Let's say. I would say probably the best way to get uh, most realism, the easiest, is making sure the anatomy is correct. Like I actually, I I lost it, but I had a skull on my desk. It's like it just miniature size. But anytime I would model a, uh, a head, I would line it up with like uh, with my eye to the monitor, and I'll put the skull in front of it, and I'll put the model behind it, and I'll, so I can make sure the skull size is correct, make sure like the jaw size is correct, and just like making sure like mm. proportions are accurate. You can have a really good sculpt, but if it, if you don't feel like the, there's bone and muscle and flesh and fat, it's not going to feel believable. And then he has also a follow-up question. (laughs) Clearly, he's a big fan. Um, (laughs) Maxime also asks, 
What is your preferred workflow? Polypaint, Mari, Substance, and any pros and cons on the ones that you use and also that you don't use? Uh, so I use Maya, Mudbox, V-Ray, and Photoshop for a couple touch-ups. That's usually it. Uh, I don't have a preference for like either. Any, I, I'm not sold on any program. I think the programs are just a tool. So I just use these tools because they're the most efficient and I know them so well, like, like inside and out. But whatever program you use, it's like it really should not be evidence in the final product anyway. If I if I could look at something like, oh, that was made in ZBrush, then maybe you're, you're doing something wrong because you shouldn't be able to see because ZBrush is in the artwork. If you can see ZBrush in the work, that's not quite what you're going for. It's like what you want is just to show something have no idea how it was created, and that's the artwork. So however however you get that, it doesn't really matter. I guess just to uh, close things out, where can we find you, and are you planning any upcoming art shows in the near future? I got an art show in Montreal at the Art Biennial in Montreal for this uh, digital oh, medium. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was pretty exciting. So that's a, a group show. That's a, pretty, yeah, that's a pretty major show, I think. Uh, so that's in November to February, I believe. But yeah, other than that, I'm just hanging out in Vancouver, working from home. <laughs> and where else can we find you online, Ian, if people want to check out some more of your work? You can check out my website, iansspriggs.com. My Instagram, just Ian Spriggs. Uh, my Twitter is Spriggs Ian. You can just Google my name, I think. That's pretty the easiest. <laughs> <Ian> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will include all of the links uh, for Ian in the show notes. So check out the show notes um, at the bottom of this page. And yeah, thank you so much, Ian. It was like really enlightening to hear about your process and dig deeper into some of your artwork. So thank you so much. I know you're a huge inspiration to to many people especially those starting out so hopefully this this gives them some some ideas on how to move forward in their own careers mm -hmm. thanks so much for having, having me appreciate it thanks for listening to the cg spectrum podcast for more on this episode visit us at cgspectrum.com forward slash podcast check out our show notes where you'll find links to our guests and more behind the scenes and if you're enjoying the show please like rate review and subscribe wherever you're listening or share this episode with someone who might like it. See you next time.